Maybe you don't know John's name, but you're certainly going to know his work. He started working at the BBC in 1980 with folks like Russell Hardy, then Fry and Laurie, French and Saunders, Absolutely Fabulous, The Vicar of Dibley, The Office, Extras, Little Britain, The Thick of It, 2012, W1A, and now Inside Number Nine. And I'm leaving out dozens of credits, but that's a pretty amazing career. Uh, he's also just written a, a book called How to Produce Comedy Bronze. It's got some great advice and some very funny stories in it. Um, before John even takes the stage, I thought we would remind ourselves that uh, he likes a little bit of Scandinavia. So can we play that clip? <laughs> so please welcome John Plowman. Am I sitting there? Okay. In the gold chair, your gold throne. Welcome. Can I just say, I'm glad to see that bit of Abfab because you look as if you're going to be in for a terribly difficult and, and dangerous autumn, or was it, you know, looking at those other programs. <laughs> it, it wasn't a laugh fest, was it? No. Let's be honest. The Scandi Noir wasn't. It no. was a lot of Scandi Noir, not a lot of Scandi laughs. laughs. Yes. Sorry. No. It's good to point out. Um, well, if it's dark all night, you know, I mean, if it's dark all day <laughs> and all night. Yes, what this are you morning's do? not been so bright, has Kill it? Kill people. Yeah. <laughs> um, one piece of advice in your book, there we go, <laughs> <laughs> um, is to tell people to find out what makes you laugh. So I was wondering, how did you find out what makes you laugh? Well, I mean, I don't know what it's like here, obviously. I, I can only speak of Britain. But you gr grow up, there was comedy on the radio, there was comedy on television, and one of my great worries is that there's less and less comedy on television. Um, and you find out w from all that what you think is funny. And it's not very difficult to, mm. s to, to sort of find a line. You know, you, you either find absurd things funny or you find absurd things silly. Yeah. Uh, you find people falling over funny or sad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and truthfully, it's both. Uh, so you have to work out, I think, what do I know? If you, if you want to work in comedy, I think it's important to know what you find funny so that you can say, look, we can make that funnier if, or we can make that less funny. And so when you were growing up, what, what wasn't on the radio you found funny? Or were there sort of classic show, comedians? The, well, there were liked? two shows in particular. There was a, this will mean absolutely <laughs> nothing, but since you've asked, uh, there was a show called I'm Sorry I'll Read That Again, which starred John Cleese, uh, of Faulty Towers fame, and a group of people who'd been to Cambridge University, who'd been Cambridge Footlights, uh, John Cleese and Bill Oddie and Joe Kendall and Tim Brooke Taylor, and they, uh, anyway, there was them, they were funny, and they did sketches uh, that were, um, I would say, slightly edgier mm. than most of the sketches on mainstream radio and television. Mm. And there was a show called Round the Horn, which uh, was the same sort of idea. And I think if, if I lament one thing, particularly on television and radio now, it's the lack of the sketch show, because the mm. sketch show is a great... Um, I've lost one already, sorry. Um, <laughs> he doesn't like John Cleese at all, uh, yeah, he's out. Yeah, could be his daughter. Um, oh, yes. <laughs> it, 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 the, one of the things I lament is the lack of sketch shows, because sketch shows are a great way of producing uh, longer-form comedy. Absolutely Fabulous, which you saw a tiny bit of there, came from uh, a sketch, a sketch that Dawn French and Jennifer Saunders did, and it was a sketch called Modern Mother and Daughter. And it was uh, about seven minutes, and it was about a girl doing her homework upstairs and her mother coming in and saying, please, please, come downstairs. We're having a party. <laughs> uh, 
you know, there's going to be some sex and drugs, but don't tell people that you're... <laughs> Um, do tell people you're going on a diet, honestly, please. Uh, and anyway, from that came uh, the series. Yeah. Well, I'd like to go ahead and jump in with AbFab because it's a show that's so beloved around the world. And, you know, maybe you can tell us a little bit, you know, you said it came from a sketch, but then how did, how did, it was Jennifer who pitched it. It came you. from a sketch. And then Jennifer decided, there was a period when they couldn't work together for various reasons. And, um, which were actually just domestic. Um, <laughs> and he said before the scandal. Anyway, anyway. Um, so Jennifer decided that this was a character she thought maybe she could write as half an hour. And she wrote uh, the, the, pilot half hour in pencil in an exercise book and said very sheepishly, look, I've, I've written this sitcom, I don't know, what do you think? Because I looked after French and Saunders. Uh, and I read it and it was extraordinary. And in a way I'd say the, the shows to make are the ones where you've got no idea what's going on. <laughs> um, not the ones where you've got no idea what's going on, because neither is the writer, but but the ones where where you think this is about another world, really. Yeah. I I had to ask Jennifer uh, if the designers and the people mentioned in the show were real. Uh, is Christian Lacroix a genuine designer, or have you made him up? <laughs> uh, he turns out to be a genuine designer, so I'm told. Um, <laughs> and. Uh, so she'd written this thing, and it was the last time in doing, let's think, we did, I don't know, seven series and five specials and a film, and it was the last time I ever saw a complete script for an episode okay. uh, before uh, we, ever, we started rehearsing or doing anything with it. But that must be nerve-wracking. How do you do that? Do you, how do you start taping when you don't have a whole script? Well, no, you don't start taping. Oh, okay. <laughs> you, <don't laughs> you, you don't start oh. taping, but you d might well start rehearsing. Um, essentially, writers work in different ways. Some writers spend a month writing an episode by themselves in a room, and at the end, it's great. Other people can't work like that. Jennifer found that uh, all, he, Jennifer worried that the second that she'd written it down, it would stop being funny. Mm. And that somehow if it stayed in her head for long enough, it would, it would get funnier. Uh, and she wasn't necessarily right. But um, so, so she was worried in a way about writing it down. Now you could say, well, good on her, but you could also say, that's a nightmare if you're trying to make a television show. <laughs> um, so, so what would happen was, at the beginning of the week, we would have something a bit like a script. Uh, it would have a story, we would know roughly where it was going to take place, <laughs> roughly what was going to happen, uh, and there would be scenes. Uh, and then you would suddenly come across a scene where it said, scene 17, Patsy and Adina have a row, brackets, don't worry, John, I'll put in some jokes later. <laughs> uh, and, and, <laughs> and that's, okay, good. Um, and she usually did, and, okay. and we would rehearse, and then she would go off, uh, and sometimes at lunchtime, she would go off at lunchtime, she'd do a bit of rewriting, and there was a lady called Ruby Wax who helped us, and then she would come back in the afternoon and say, look, I think I'm going to ha sort of have a go at rewriting this now, so don't learn anything, and maybe we should, if you just go home, I'll rewrite. Uh, and the week, I don't know, somehow we got to, uh, we used to read through on Sunday and, re and uh, rehearse during the week and then record on Thursday and Friday, and somehow we got to Thursday and Friday and record wow. something. And would it, <laughs> while you're actually shooting, would they sort of improv at all no, at that stage? Not re you don't really have really time, Really not I guess. very much at all. It's difficult. I mean, improv is w wonderful in its way, but it's difficult to, 
it's difficult with a with a camera crew and a designer and a mm. people lighting sets and other actors. It's difficult to do it mm -hmm. in front of an audience uh, live. You know, it's that's it's not easy to do it in that way. So, just occasionally, I do remember an episode where we got to the end of the episode and the audience didn't laugh much like. This morning, I know, laughter at 9.30 in the morning <laughs> is hard. I don't blame you. And your Scandinavian, <coughs> by and large. So, fine. Uh, but the audience didn't laugh at the last line of the show. Uh, so we went into a huddle. We did what they do on American shows. We went into a huddle and we came up with a different line. And we did it again. We said, OK, and did a different line. No laughs. Uh, huddle, 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 different line, no laughs. So at the end of the third time, uh, Joanna Lumley, who plays Patsy, who's the one with the tall hair, um, <laughs> came, went to the audience and said, now look, when I say the word accessorise, <laughs> could you laugh? Because then we can all go home. Um, <laughs> and it worked. Yeah. That's all you have to do is ask. Yeah, yeah, go oh. prompt the audience. Yeah. Um, of course, it's so beloved now, but I wonder back in the day, you know, you've got pretty selfish. I had no idea what it was about. Yeah. And did the BBC bosses, did they get it? Did they like these characters? Did they think we it was going to be We were very lucky hit? in that the show, uh, well, in the afternoon of the recording, we rehearsed the show, and I said, sitting at the back of the audience was the then head of comedy at the BBC. It was a man called Robin Nash, and I said, what do you think? And he said, I've never found women being drunk very funny. <laughs> and I Not thought, well, that's him. it. That's no <laughs> show. Uh, but fortunately, <laughs> then, it went upstairs uh, to the head of something or other, the channel, I suppose. <laughs> and, um, and before that, he watched it, it was shown, as it were, to a little group of uh, PAs and, and secretaries who'd heard that it was funny and female and blah, blah, blah. Uh, And they were all laughing very hard one lunchtime when he came in uh, and saw what they were laughing at. So I think it was, it was them uh, that I had to pay. No, thank, thank. <laughs> it was them I had to thank for, for the show being on at all. Mm -hmm. And then ex uh, this will mean nothing given where we are, but it did 7.7 .7 million on uh, its first outing on BBC oh. Two, which is extraordinary. When you think that if anything now gets over a million, they open the champagne uh, on BBC Two. And I, I, I think it says, I think it shows something about comedy that I think I've learned, which is that it has to be about something. I know that sounds stupid, but it doesn't, you know, if you ask the average person what, they're, what they think writing comedy must be about, well, it must be about writing jokes and, and funny people. Mm. And I don't think it is about that. I think it's about finding something to write about, something truthful to write about. So this was about the absurdity of public relations and the absurdity of the fashion industry. And w we did a show more recently called W1A, which is about the BBC and, uh, and the absurdity of modern office life. The office was about the absurdity of modern life. Uh, you have to have something particular that the show's about, I think. It needs to sort of be grounded or inspired from some yeah, kind of reality. Yeah, it's got to be grounded in truth. Uh, the, yeah. uh, and, and, and then you've got to find some characters, and then you've got to surprise the audience. Mm. It seems to me comedy is, is actually about surprise. It's not about uh, jokes, really. It's, it's about finding, putting, finding something to write about. You know, it could be middle-aged angst, it could be teenage angst, it could be <laughs> uh, the problems of trying to leave a, an economic union when you're a small country. Oh, like dear. It could be. Uh, I'm not saying it should be, I'm okay. saying that's, 
hilarious without being written as a comedy. Uh, uh, anyway, that's a very dark um, comedy, I would say. <laughs> uh, the B word. It's yes. a mess. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, 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 there's got to be some. You know, we, I did a show called The Vicar of Dibley, which was written by uh, Richard Curtis, and and what Richard early, very early on, before anything was written, he said, can we just, as it were, leak to the press that uh, he <laughs> wanted to write a show about women vicars? Because up until that point, in fact, after that point, up and around that time, the idea of women being vicars or not was being discussed. And there weren't vicars in, in the, there weren't female vicars in the Church of England. And so it was a relatively hot topic, and, and various people, I think, were going to sit down and try and write things. And uh, he wanted to get in there first. <laughs> so there you are. It's a relatively serious subject, but from it, he made a very warm and friendly comment. Mm. Sorry. That's, uh, Don't be sorry. We like your stories. Sorry? We like your stories. Don't That's be sorry. That's okay. Um, I wanted to go ahead and ask about The Office, because it's you know, one of the great comedies of our time. Um, actually, before I ask, maybe we'll show a clip of The Office to remind ourselves of its genius. And you can watch it on here if you want. <clears throat> Hooray. Yes. yes. So, was it Ricky Jervis and Stephen Merchant who came to you, or just Ricky, or how did Ricky that work? and Stephen. Uh, Stephen directs uh, at uh, Ricky and Stephen came into my office and said, we've come to see you because we're told you'll say yes to anything. Uh, <laughs> that's what he says now. Uh. Um, they came in and they ha I knew that this I this, uh, they'd been going around various television outlets with this idea. So I, it, somehow it was in the air. And they came in and they had such... Uh, Hutzpah. They had such confidence in the idea. They had. They were. They'd already won in their heads. They'd already won Golden Globes, <laughs> and it was already on in America. And they'd already. You know, it, it, there was such confidence about it. And they. They'd. Uh, Stephen had been on the BBC. Then, sadly, not now. Ran a course to train young people as directors. And Stephen had been on that, and at the end of that, people had to make a little film. And normally, people made things not unlike what we saw earlier. You know, they made things about people being beaten up, or they made things about really? how terrible it is yeah. living on the being homeless, uh, and and things that are just uh, you know about as funny as a baby's open grave. And um, forgive the expression, sorry. Uh, and um, <laughs> They, they came in with this, with one scene. They came in with the scene uh, which became the first scene of the first episode in which um, Ricky is talking about the, a forklift truck uh, exercise and he, he says about, uh, you know, I know the guy who, who does the exams and he does a Pinocchio nose. I'm sorry, that's why I'm doing that. <laughs> um, and so, you know, I just thought, well, it, somebody's got to do it. <laughs> uh, and it seemed entirely, uh, they knew about, you know, they absolutely knew this character. And I think, again, that's another important thing about comedy, that, that, that you, know, uh, you, you know about whom you're writing, if that makes sense. You know, you know in other words, you know a lot about whoever it is. And they really knew this guy, David Brent. Uh, and so we made a pilot and we took it to the channel and the channel said, oh, I don't know, you decide, to me. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I said, all right, well, we'll give it a series. So we gave it a series. Uh, and that was shot with a certain amount of, I don't know, I, I worried, I remember very early on getting reports back from the the set that said they were shooting at an incredibly high ratio. Mm. You know, the amount, it doesn't apply now, but the amount of film <laughs> they were shooting to the amount of cut footage we would end up with was, was something like, I don't know, 20 to 1. 
and on average it should be, if you're lucky, somewhere between eight and ten to okay. one. Anyway, th so they were wildly overshooting, largely because they were making each other laugh. <laughs> but that's a good sign. But yeah, exactly. In other words, Stephen and Ricky were laughing so much at uh, what <laughs> other people were doing that they had to then go back and shoot it again without people. Anyway. And do you see the office's influence today when you watch other shows? Yeah, I think what it what I like about it, I mean, obviously I like a lot about it, but, but it has a good, it's, it's good at the moments that aren't funny as well as at the moments that are funny. Mm. There's a, <laughs> I remember having a long discussion about silence with them at one point in the edit. There's a scene uh, at the end, I mean, maybe it's at the end of the whole thing, the British thing, where... Martin Freeman's character it goes into a room with uh, Dawn... The Tim and Dawn. Tim and Dawn go into, um, go into an office away from everybody. Uh, and finally, Tim is going to say something to, to Dawn, or he isn't. Uh, or is she going to go off with the, with the relatively repellent guy? Uh, and Tim takes his mic off. Now, one of the tricks of The Office was this idea that it was being filmed mm. by a documentary crew who were there, and that that was why we were seeing what we were seeing. And that, that partly came because at the time there were a lot of series on British television called things like Hotel, Garage, <laughs> Sofa Shop, you know, whatever. Fly on the wall sort of. Fly on the wall yeah. shows, you know. <laughs> Betty has a problem with somebody at reception. Is she going to give them a room or not? Yeah. And There's a lot of the know, airport, I find. Like There's the care. baggage guys. Yeah, exactly. Like, oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so this was partly trying... And I know one of the worries that the channel had was, A, would people realise that this wasn't one of those? This and is it, fiction. And yeah. it took a while. And B... <laughs> Would it kill off that brand, yeah. which was a very good, cheap and easy brand, <laughs> and why would you want to knock it? Anyway, um, why was I talking about that? Oh, Tim's taking off Tim's taking off the thing. So we had a long discussion about what sort of silence it should be. Should it be the silence of you can hear everything else, but you can't hear what they're saying? Should it be complete silence? Now, complete silence on television is rarely heard. Because it feels like a mistake. Sorry? It feels like a mistake. It feels like a mistake. Yeah. And also you worry that the people who transmit uh, will suddenly panic <laughs> and will suddenly think the sound has dropped out and start switching knobs. And, and uh, famously, Bride said we visited hundreds of years ago, they deliberately desaturated the colour from it, <sighs> but didn't tell the engineer. So on the first <laughs> night it went out and then woof, up with the colour. <laughs> anyway, um, so we, there was that worry and, 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 and it was interesting that, that a comedy throws up those sorts of ideas. Mm. I mean, just the idea of what is reality and what is, how do you translate that? Does that answer your question? I think I so, think I've yes. No, I, I mean, I wish there was something like The Office on today, and it doesn't So do I. Feel there like is. It's called The Office, and it's in lots of different countries. Yes. <laughs> did you like the US That's remake? Oh, the bureau, pun. The US remake? Did you, did you like yeah, it? Yeah, I different, remember. But I went. Uh, yes, it's, I mean, it's different. It's, yeah. it, it's, it's warmer it's and... Not, yes, it's not really the office, no. but that's fine. They, yeah. they should do what works for them. Yeah. And well done for finding a way of doing an American pilot of a British show that works. Yeah. I went over when we did the pilot of Absolutely Fabulous for American television. It was just... Horrible. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, I missed that one, and I, maybe there's well, a reason. It, it, the pl girl playing Safi was Zoskia Mamet. Zoskia Mamet oh. is the now daughter of David Mamet, playwright, well known and rather brilliant playwright. And David Mamet came to the recording, <laughs> and I was lucky enough to be introduced to him. And I said to him, If this goes to series, will you write 
some episodes? And he said, yes, I'd love to. And he think, I really want to see David Mallett's <laughs> version of Absolutely <laughs> Fabulous. Oh. And also to see how much people would swear and, and how much the American um, standards and practices would uh, worry about it. Oh, women aren't allowed to drink like that. Oh, so, yeah. yeah. Women being drunk is really very funny. Yes. Um, you know, but it doesn't feel Except like right now we're in a comedy boom time to me. We're not. And it's Why? Well, I, th well, who knows, <laughs> a social... We need a laugh, that's for sure. <laughs> Judging by what I saw first thing this morning, <laughs> we really do need a laugh. Um, or we need something that sends all those up. It seemed to me that there were, there were ample opportunities for jokes involving people being shot and guns and... and anyway. Yeah. Uh, why isn't there much comedy? I think there isn't much comedy because there hasn't been much comedy. Oh. Uh, I, in writing the book, I, I look back, and in Britain, and I, again, I apologize for not being in Britain. Uh, <laughs> or, you know what I mean. Um, in, in Britain in 1993, which isn't so long ago, I mean, it's long ago, it, you know, most of you weren't born, I know, but uh, <laughs> there were, uh, two comedies on most evenings, most Monday to Friday on BBC One was mostly comedy, eight till nine, oh. and then drama at nine to ten. Um, and now there isn't. Now there's one comedy on BBC One uh, and the, a few more on BBC Two, but mostly the comedy comes from panel shows. Mm. Uh, now, why is this? Uh, laziness. No. Uh, it's partly because there isn't... I mean, I know this sounds stupid, but there isn't any situation comedy on British television, or there isn't as much as there should be, because there hasn't been as much as there should be. In other words, people only learn how to do it by watching, watching. it, I think. You know, I was lucky. I was... Uh, I grew up in a time when there was a lot of comedy on television. Mm. So I saw a lot. I was, you know, I laughed at a lot. I was able to see Monty Python the first time round. And, and, uh, and I think in that way people learn how to do it. And I think the problem is that there aren't enough things inspiring people to, to have a go. Mm. And sketch shows are important because you can have a go at something that's a small idea mm. uh, and, and see if a small idea gets to be a bigger idea. But do you think commissioners think comedy is too risky? Well, yes, of course it's risky, but drama... It costs risky. less. Sorry? Uh, it costs less than drama. It costs, it costs less. And half an hour of, of uh, television comedy in Britain costs, let's say, £300,000, which is... Uh, 500,000 krona? No. What? My... Uh, how much? Three million krona. Three million krona, you see? Yeah. Oof, who knew? Uh, the other way. Okay. It, it costs quite a lot. But <laughs> <laughs> a drama, therefore... So that's for half an hour. So an hour of drama should cost two times that. It doesn't. It costs about four times that. It costs four times that, and it's still risky. But it should mean that people can do comics, you know, just throw a few more onto the screen. N n not all of them will work. Most of them won't work on the first series. The Office didn't work on its first outing. It was only because the, the channel controller was sensible enough to see that, that, that it did something that most comedies don't do. Most comedies start here, this, if this is an aud <laughs> imaginary audience graph, if this is the imaginary audience graph and zero is down here, they start here and then they go, mm, mm. <laughs> Okay, got that. Graphic, <laughs> I thought graphically exciting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, in other words, they start high and then they go down. But The Office did something that most shows don't do. It started high, it went down, but then it went up, as it, you know, so by the and end of, of mouth, the first series, yeah. it went up. Word of mouth was, this is not a reality TV show. <laughs> this, is, this is about this the is office. Not the this hotel. is not the hotel, this is this the is office. This is about your boss. Yeah. It's, and, 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 you know, the, there was huge, a huge amount made about how 
everybody's boss was a bit like David Brent. Um, oh, I've had everybody. Good night, if you did. Yeah. Uh, and 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 so you have to persevere with comedy. So what the controller of BBC Two did was she repeated the show three months after it had originally mm. been out. And most shows don't do that. Don't get that chance. Uh, yeah. and, and it doubled its original audience. So to double on a repeat is extraordinary. I mean, that that's, oh. doesn't happen usually. But it doubled its audience on the repeat. In other words, people now knew it was a, definitely a comedy and, and they'd better watch it. Um, so you, you have to persevere. Yeah. The, the most famous, not famous, but the most successful comedy in Britain over the last, I don't know, 30 years has probably been a show called Only Fools and Horses. Only Fools and Horses uh, wasn't a hit until series three. So they made, that means 12 episodes went out and, and they were liked, they were quite nice, you know, they had people that the audience had heard of, uh, it was written by a, a fairly solid comedy writer and so actually it was written by a guy called John Sullivan who had been a scene shifter in television studios back in the day when we made things in studios and had sets and he was one of the guys who would come in at 10 o'clock at night work overnight moving sets in and out and then uh, go home in the morning and he came, used to come in early just to watch the shows. And he finally got the courage to go to uh, the producer of one of those shows and say, look, I think I could do a bit better than most <laughs> stuff you're doing. <laughs> and I've... And How I've did that go it, down? And I've had a... Well, <laughs> he'd had a go uh, and he handed uh, this thing in and actually it became a series. Wow. So I had no idea that's how it... Story. Sorry? I didn't know that's how it started. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. Have a go is what I, yeah. is. I mean, do you think... My keynote for the day. <laughs> have a go. When in doubt, do it. But that is good advice. I mean, do you think that, you know, there's a lot of comedy specials on Netflix. Yeah. You know, there might be sketch stuff on YouTube or, or other platforms. Yes, Do you think I mean that can easier. help? Yes, of course, because it's easier now than it's ever been to make something. And put it uh, out. You know, two yeah. or three minutes something. Even if it's, you know, the cat eating, you know, next door's mm. budgie. Well, uh, yesterday we saw a... small bird, so... Yeah, yeah. We saw a, f uh, a f video of a man asleep on a train that had gone viral, and people were... Wondering hilarious. when he was going to wake up and pledging money to him and hilarious. Yeah. Already, it's hilarious <laughs> and could be a series. It probably, <laughs> it shouldn't be a series, but it could. <laughs> if Ricky Gervais does it, maybe. Yeah. Um, are there any questions for John? Comments, questions. I've, I've, why do you? But oh, we've oh, go, oh, well done. Oh. Hand, one half. One a back hand there, and then we'll come to Lisa Lott in the front. Can do you want to? Uh, we've got a. Give it a crack. You can shout and we'll repeat it. You yeah. can project. Thank you for being so entertaining and Well, you say that. <laughs> <laughs> say that now. <laughs> oh, good. I'd like to hear you talk about some of your most valuable mistakes during ah. your career and what you learned from them. Valuable mistakes. Well, of course, as with mistakes, one always blames other people. Um, <laughs> So one mistake, which I think wasn't mine, uh, was a show we did with a small Scottish uh, comedian, uh, uh, and she sidled up to the controller of BBC Two, who's a man called Mark Thompson, and Mark Thompson now runs, uh, it's just so you can see, a career in television is worthwhile, he now runs the New York Times. And I am told on relatively good authority that in his office at the top of the New York Times building, he has his own restaurant. He has a restaurant in the office. So, you know, come lunchtime, people come in. So anyway, anyway, this wasn't my mistake. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this woman sidled up to Mark Thompson uh, at a party and said, I should be on television. Uh, you should give me a series. Uh, because I know, she said, uh, 
what, why American comedies are better than British comedies. And she said, uh, because, you know, because the thing about American comedies is they're not about anything. Now, wrong, okay? <laughs> That's just wrong. It's not that they're not about anything, it's that they appear not to be about anything and actually are about That's lots right. of things. Think yeah. of the average episode of Seinfeld. It's not about nothing. Um, they didn't employ 12 writers per show to just sit yeah. around and do nothing. But, but anyway, he, I think foolishly, gave her a show and then forced us to make it. Uh, and and let's cut to the chase. That was a mistake. Uh, it that wasn't your mistake. Mi no, it wasn't my. I told you. you know, <laughs> Blame mistakes. other people. Yeah. Okay. He and got a, a, a genuine out of mistake it. I made was uh, getting a pilot and persuading a well known actress to be in it, but not making clear that I thought that the leading character should be played in her normal voice. You know, this was a woman who is known to the British television audience for being, for sounding, I, I don't know, let's say a bit like me, you know, sounding uh, non-regional Southern English, just ordinary English, I would say, but uh, it's a different argument. Uh, <laughs> she suddenly decided she was going to play this character in a Northern accent. And I should at that moment have said, Forget. Let's all go home. Let's let's <laughs> just let's do something else today. Uh, but I didn't, uh, and and I think it was probably her way of saying I really didn't want to do this show, mm -hmm. uh, and and this is how she got out of it because she knew if she did a pilot in a northern <laughs> accent, I mean I, I can't tell you what a mistake. That was. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I haven't really answered your question, but I've no, that's fine. One mistake. Liz you Lott. had a question. Hello. Uh, do you remember this idea about a comedy on the, about the border of, of Finland and North Korea? I'm sorry. The, the border between Finland and North Korea by John Glees, a discussion about the, the border comedy. between Finland, Finland and, and North Korea. Korea. With and exist. Australia? Yeah. No, North Korea. 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 Is there a, is there a no. border between the, Finland? <laughs> The, this was I'm a con sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, this was a concept we just dis once discussed when we were talking about comedy and John Cleese was making Cleese. laughs about the border between Finland and Korea. And then we were discussing if you could make a comedy show about this. And, and now when you say that you, you ha it has to be about something and you have to know this, then the answer is you can't do it if you don't know what the border about Finland and Korea is, about something that is not real. So my question to you is, what should we make a comedy about? What, what, are you, what would you expect today, because there is lack of comedy? What are you expecting? What subjects would it be nice to, to have as a comedy show? Yeah. And, and why aren't they being made? Yeah. I think I understand what, what, what is the... What should be a com what should a comedy be made about today? Well, yeah. it should obviously be made about Brexit, and but it should be made about something like Brexit is huge, so you've got to make it small and relatable. Uh, there was a show many years ago called Yes Minister uh, in Britain. So if you make it about the the two civil servants who are negotiating something very small. They're negotiating the size of fish that are allowed to be caught uh, yeah. between 12 o'clock and <laughs> 6 o'clock. Let's, I don't yeah. know, that may not be a point of, doesn't matter. So take something large and find uh, the smallness, but Such make it idea. something <coughs> real. Because the reason for making something real is because <coughs> it's relatable for the audience. And it has a life. There is a chance that if you write episode one, uh, there will be something to write episode two about. Uh, whereas if you write episode one about, as it were, a joke, it's harder, you know, because you've got to come up with a different joke. Um, we wrote a show, I don't know, W1A, are you going to... Yeah, I think we okay, would have love a look to show this. Okay, let me... So any broadcaster in the room, I think, is going to recognise a little bit of W1A. Yeah. And this is and I'll talk loosely about it inspired by the BBC. Or yeah. So can and we show it that stars a man who was in a show called Downton Abbey, if you've seen that. Lord Grantham. Yeah. Yes. 
I think we're gonna show it now. Hopefully those of you who work in television offices don't recognize that. Okay. Uh, uh, it has, it, this show came about in a very odd uh, way. We made a show called 2012, about when, which was when London had the Olympics. Uh, and it seemed to me London getting the Olympics must be a cause for uh, hilarity. <laughs> Uh, and so I rang the only person I knew who knew anything about sport. Uh, and I knew he knew anything about sport because he played five-a-side football every Wednesday night. Uh, <laughs> so that effort. seemed to be his qualification. So we wrote the show about that. And um, that was very successful. Uh, but at the end of it, the Olympics happened and was a success. Uh, and so the show had to finish. So we sat around and said, what, in what other world could that character, and it's Hugh Bonneville's character, Ian, in that clip, um, could that, in, in what other world could that character work? And we talked about the army and the National Health Service and, and the other, and then he said, well, the one place I'd really wanted to put him, but I don't suppose anybody would ever let me, uh, is the BBC. Uh, and we all said, oh yes, please, please, please do this about the BBC. And we didn't ever really ask the BBC if that was okay. Yeah. And I think that's probably the secret of the show. And it's maybe the secret of many shows. Don't ask, just do it. Uh, <laughs> and, and wait until somebody says no. Um, this is a diversion, but we, I, we once did a show at the time that Big Brother and reality shows like that were being very popular. We did a show where we asked a lot of, uh, we asked 10 uh, D-list celebrities, <laughs> people who are known but not much. Um, <laughs> you know, you might know them, but your mother wouldn't, you know, that. Uh, and we said we're doing a show in a sh in a um, porter cabin. Do you know what I mean? A, 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 a sort of cabin in the middle of a building site. Uh, and we would like to invite you to take part in this <laughs> pilot. And there was a weatherman and a famous athlete and a famous uh, model and and a, somebody's son. Anyway, they came and they were locked in this place for a day. And they were given various things to do. Uh, and at no point did anybody ask whether they were going to be filmed doing this. And they weren't. <laughs> so, so the only record we had of it was some, photo some uh, like photographs that had been taken. And we then showed them to various random people to say, can you verify that this took place? And, <laughs> and afterwards, we wrote and said, thank you for very much for taking part. And, uh, uh, you know, this wasn't filmed, but, you know, thank you for taking part in the fun. Uh, and only one person uh, objected. Uh, an agent rang up and said, I absolutely forbid you to show any footage involving my client. And we said, but look, there's there is footage. no footage <laughs> involving your client. And, and it was an example, I think it was quite a good example of doing something because things like Big Brother are truly awful and abominations <laughs> and really shouldn't be allowed. And, and so having a go at them is a very good thing. Just, I don't know, just do it if you can. Yeah. Um, then ask permission afterwards. I'm afraid we're out of time, oh God. which is so sad because we could listen to this man's stories all day. But I think you've given but some you good advice, which them. is you can buy the stories. <laughs> available I on Amazon. I, I'm not sure. It is available on Amazon UK. Amazon.co.uk. Really <laughs> and what you do is you put in John Plowman, which is my name, J-O-N-P-L-O-W-M-A-N. Uh, <laughs> And it's called How to Produce Comedy Bronze. No, it's got some good advice and some great stories, as you can Thank imagine. You. Um, so, 
as John Plummer says, just go and do can it. Can I say it's Let's been have a some thrill comedy. to be here in Finland? Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> you know how to get them. Um, but thank you, John. Thank I've you so much for being here. I've always wanted to come to the land of Santa. <laughs> <laughs> that was excellent. <laughs>